Welcome, everybody. I want to thank you for taking the time to join us this evening to learn all about wild bees in Vermont. My name is Julie Filiberti, and I am a um, member of the board of the Friends of Missisquoi National Wildlife Refuge. And that's who's hosting this presentation for you this evening. So I know we have participants tonight from all over Vermont and maybe even beyond Vermont. So um, some of you might not have ever visited the Missisquoi National Wildlife Refuge. So let me tell you a little bit about that. So the refuge is located in the Northwest corner of Vermont in Swanton. And it was established in 1943 to provide a protected resting spot and feeding area for migrating waterfowl. It encompasses 7,218 acres of land and water. And in 2013, it was designated a Ramsar wetland of international importance. A majority of the refuge is composed of wetlands and floodplain forest where the Missisquoi River empties into Lake Champlain. This area is the most expansive intact floodplain forest in the state of Vermont. And also on the refuge, we have the largest bog in the Northeast, the Maquam Bog, which is 900 acres. In addition to these expanses of unique habitat, um, there's also some shrubland and the refuge maintains about 250 acres of managed grasslands. So the refuge is an essential resting and feeding stopover for migrating ducks and geese and shorebirds and other water birds. And it's a haven for 17 state threatened or endangered species, including the spiny soft-shell turtle, the black tern, and the recently listed eastern meadowlark. Mm. The lands and waters of the Missisquoi National Wildlife Refuge are very special places to those who make it their home. And we, as the current stewards of this area, recognize our responsibilities in caring for these lands and waters. They're a critical resting and feeding spot for numerous migrating birds, and the plant life they support provide essential habitat for deer, beaver, muskrats, turtles, insects, and other animals that make this place their year-round home. We recognize that these lands and waters are also important to the Abenaki Nation of Missisquoi, the original caretakers of this land. We are grateful to them and their ancestors for caring for this land and its surrounding waters for thousands of years. Their families have been nourished by fishing and hunting in the Betabakwa, which is Lake Champlain, and the length of the Mazipsko Isibo, which is the Missisquoi River. For generations, their people have been sustained by hunting and gathering in the lush forest and by growing corn and beans and squash in the fertile earth. We understand the importance of this land to the Abenaki, present and past. We recognize the hardships and suffering these families endured when they were pushed out of their traditional ancestral lands as European colonization took hold and acknowledge the agony and despair of having the last remaining families forcefully removed by the United States government to create this wildlife refuge. We acknowledge the continual struggles that they endure in keeping their culture alive in the world of today. We, the Friends of Missisquoi National Wildlife Refuge, welcome the opportunity to assist the Abenaki Nation of Missisquoi in maintaining their close connection with their ancestral lands and through education and partnership to help bring awareness to their culture and existence. We invite our visitors to share in honoring this vision by engaging in mindfulness while enjoying the refuge lands and waters and holding the space with care and appreciation. So for those of you who may not be familiar with the work of the Friends of Missisquoi, I'd like to tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do and see if we can encourage your support. We are a nonprofit group that works to support the, the refuge in basically whatever way we can. Um, we promote awareness of the refuge through public outreach and by organi organizing educational and fun events like this one here this evening. Um, we hold monthly public bird walks to monitor the bird species on the refuge 
and participate in community science by recording our sightings in eBird. Um, we donate funding to support education on the refuge and financially assist the refuge in um, acquiring grants for invasive species control. Basically, we work with the refuge manager to provide any assistance that he deems helpful for the operation of the refuge when those, the federal funds just don't stretch far enough. So we are always looking for new members to join us and um, support the refuge. So um, please check out our website. It's friendsofmrsgoy.org. And on that website, you can give a donation, you can become a member and um, check out what we have there. So we have a calendar um, and it lists all of our upcoming events. It lists our bird walks that we have every month. And um, a couple events we have coming up, I'd just like to tell you about. About a month from now on Thursday, April 21st, we are co-sponsoring an event with the Green Mountain Audubon Society, um, dealing with the life and the migration of the timber doodle. So the timber doodle or the American woodcock is that bird that has arrived on its, on its breeding grounds here in Vermont. And it, um, it lets us know that spring is there with the beautiful, wonderful twilight aerial displays. So I don't know if you've ever gotten to see those, but that's, that's something worth seeing. So if you wanna learn about the timber doodle, you can join us next month. And coming up in May, we have an art show and a host of activities and presentations um, for our International Migratory Bird Day celebration. So all of those things you can find on our website. So please check it out. So for our presentation tonight, um, just a few housekeepings. If you have any questions, we ask that you put those in the chat and um, we'll take some time during the presentation in a couple of spots and definitely at the end to answer any questions that, that might have come up. For your best, best viewing pleasure, make sure your Zoom screen is in speaker mode so you can definitely see all the, the great pictures of bees that Spencer has brought. So now at last, I would like to introduce you to Spencer Hardy. He is a biologist with the Vermont Center for Eco Studies. He's the coordinator of the Wild Bee Survey and he is quickly becoming a rising wild bee expert. So Spencer, thank you for sharing your time with us tonight and your knowledge. And I'm gonna turn it over to you to teach us about wild bees. Thank you, Julie. Um, thanks you all for tuning in tonight. Um, yeah, I'm gonna talk about work that I've been doing for the Vermont Center for Eco Studies across Vermont and then uh, most recently at uh, Missisco Wildlife Refuge in the past summer, um, where things like the sheep laurel mining miner have been found. Um, all the pictures will be either mine or with photo credits and from bees that are in Vermont. Um, I guess brief overview of Mount Center for Eco Studies. We're a small nonprofit located in Norwich, Vermont, focusing on um, uniting people and science for conservation. We work on um, mountaintop birds, um, amphibians, uh, bees, quite a number of things in Vermont. And this is a project of the Vermont Atlas of Life, which is a uh, part of VCE dedicated to documenting the biodiversity of this state. So I'm gonna start to talk briefly about Western honeybees because it's hard to talk about bees and not talk about honeybees. Uh, this is what most people default to when they hear the word bee, uh, yet it's only a very small portion of what, what bees are, and um, there's a lot of misconceptions around it. Most of you have probably heard about the decline of bees and are concerned for the health of bee populations. Um, a lot of that is based on honeybees, and even that is um, not entirely uh, accurately portrayed in that uh, the number of honeybees in the United States is higher now than it was in the early 2000s. This is a figure from the USDA 
showing the number of honeybee colonies um, in the thousands. So uh, in this decade, there was 2.4 million colonies in, uh, in the US. And now there's even more than that. Um, what this also shows though, is that the yield of honey per colony has declined from 69 pounds to 57 pounds in that same time period, which is an indication of declining colony health, which is the cause for concern for most people that are worried about um, bee populations. A lot of this, and I'm not a honeybee expert, but um, I've gleaned some of it from being in this, in this realm. A lot of uh, this concern is coming from Varroa mite, this uh, disc-shaped uh, arthropod here that was introduced into the United States, has spread across the country and is um, causing lots of problems for honeybee colonies. Uh, it spreads disease, it feeds on the larva in the nests. Um, but asking a, uh, talking about honeybees to a wild bee biologist is sort of equivalent to talking about chickens with a bird biologist. Um, they're a domesticated animal, ostensibly, in, in the United States, um, native to parts of Europe and Asia, introduced along in basically as soon as people got to this continent, as soon as Europeans got to this continent, um, they brought been brought over for pollination and for honey production. They're ubiquitous in almost every landscape. This one in a in a bog similar to Maquam bog. And most, if not all, of the um, bees in Vermont, honeybees in Vermont are coming from someone's backyard or from a farm. There are very few wild honeybee colonies still in existence in Vermont that I'm aware of. There were some, and then this mite came, and then it became nearly impossible for these wild colonies to survive the winter because they had less honey and they were in um, lower health overall. So that's honeybees. Um, I'm not going to talk much more about them. I'm happy to answer questions about them as, and as they how they relate to other bees uh, at some point further along. So feel free to put questions in the slide at any point. I'm keeping an eye on it and I'll stop when there's a good point and when I have a, a couple of questions. So next is what are bees? Um, honeybees are bees, yes, but there's also a lot more to bees. And it's not um, a straightforward group to define in some ways. It's not like birds. It's not, they're not lizards. There's not um, a well-known public definition. The scientific definition is these seven families um, that make up the epifamily anthophila, which is a group of the order Hymenoptera. Also in the group, the order Hymenoptera, you have your ants, wasps, um, a variety of four-winged uh, segmented insects, the bees being one group of them. Um, the colloquial definition of bees that I most relate to is that they are vegetarian wasps. They are in this hymenopter, which is made up primarily of wasps, and they feed exclusively on plant parts, in this case, pollen. Most wasps are carnivorous, either eating other insects, carrion, um, other sources of protein, whereas bees get all of their protein from pollen, directly from the plants. And this is relevant in addition to, um, it's relevant in that it relates to how the bees, their morphology of the bees. Uh, if you zoomed in really closely on one of these leg hairs on this, um, four millimeter bee, you'd see these microscopic hairs and you, they have these branches on them, which are unique to, to bees. Uh, and this is an adaptation to collect pollen grains. Um, added surface area, you get some static electric, electricity buildup that can grab a hold of pollen grains um, and allow the bee to, to collect the pollen that they use to feed their offspring and to eat themselves. You can see on this bee here, both legs have a large mass of pollen grains that they've sort of stuck there with uh, a combination of nectar and pollen. Um, so that's bees. 
the project that I've been working on for the past three years, Vermont Wild Bee Survey, um, has a variety of goals. The first and foremost being to generate a list of the bee species that are known from the state. When we started this project, uh, we really did not have a list of the bees that were here. You couldn't go online and find which bees had been documented in Vermont. Um, and also very little bee research had been done. So the list was far from complete in terms of documenting the species that were likely to occur here. Um, so we've been working on this list, this, list, this checklist basically, and we've been doing that by gathering bee records, some with a net, some from museums, some with cameras, some from volunteers, gathering these specimens and publishing the data to the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. This is an online clearinghouse of biodiversity data. So things like eBird, iNaturalist, um, museum collections of mammals, of birds, of plants, any biodiversity data can be published to GBIV and then it's publicly available for researchers to, to study. So we've been generating data, sharing it with GBIV and are now in the process of analyzing that data to figure out what we do know about bees in Vermont. Um, trying to assess conservation statuses for all the species. These are things like threatened and endangered that are used for um, landowners and wildlife agencies to determine where to prioritize conservation funding, um, protect rare habitats, that kind of thing. So creating conservation ranks for all the species, identify habitats of regional and statewide importance, um, places that uh, host bees that aren't found elsewhere in the state or elsewhere in the region, and then trying to involve more Vermonters in the process of understanding the biodiversity that's around them and often um, in their backyard and easily overlooked. So this is uh, just some quick slides showing the data that we've gathered so far. These are data sets published to uh, GBIV, which I just mentioned. This is our work. This is iNaturalist. So these are observations that anyone with this app can take a picture of a, a bug in their yard, upload it, not have any idea what it is. Um, some experts will find it, identify it, and then it'll end up in GBIV and we can download that data to help us understand bee distributions and abundances throughout the state. Um, also in here are some data sets we've gathered from independent researchers, from UVM studies, and then some, this is a Missisquoi bumblebee data set that was done a few years back that we've um, curated and shared. All in all, we have about 50,000 records of bees from Vermont going back to 1848 and that, um, forming the basis of our knowledge on Vermont bees. And I natural, as you can see, a steady growth in observations. Uh, very seasonal, not to be, as to be expected, um, but it's becoming a very large and powerful data set for collection of bee distributions and occurrences. Uh, this is a small smattering of the bees of Vermont and um, a collage showing the diversity of uh, natural histories, habitats, flower preferences, and then I'm going to go into each of these groups a little more detail, um, give some examples. So believe it or not, we have 353 plus or minus species of bees in Vermont. Um, that's on par with the number of bird species that have been recorded for Vermont. Many other states in New England have a similar number. I think in the US, there's something like 4,000 bee species. And globally, the estimate is about 20,000, but there remain many species that are undescribed. Even in Vermont, we have a few species that are likely um, not formally described in the scientific literature. So it's a tremendous diversity and there's um, a wide range of ways that these bees exist in the landscape, wide ranges of sizes, and it's a complex group that is hard to generalize. So I'm going to split it up into a couple different groups and I'll talk about each of these groups and then um, talk about what I found at Missouri. And in the end, I'll talk about what landowners and the concerned public can do to, to help these groups because pollination is a, ends up being a very important part of ecosystem services. Uh, I don't have to, it's no surprise to anybody that um, pollination is important for growing food, for maintaining wildflowers. Uh, almost all plants are 
all plants need some kind of pollination. Insect pollination is a major um, contributing factor to the pollination of uh, many vital uh, food crops and things that make the ecosystem more vibrant and enjoyable for all. So I'm going to talk about bumblebees last. Um, we've got roughly 20% of our native species are pollen specialists, meaning they only gather pollen from a small number of plant um, species or genera. Another 25% um, are kleptoparasitic. These are some of my favorite. These are bees that um, take over the nests of other species. If you're familiar with brown-headed cowbirds, it's a similar strategy, um, often called cuckoo uh, bees, because they get, they're similar to how the European cuckoos um, parasitize other bird nests. Uh, last count, we have about 15 non-native species, so species that were not on uh, this continent prior to Europeans, and about 12% of the species of bees nest above ground in cavities in plants and, or other places, and uh, I'll talk about those in a second. So generalists, um, bumblebees are a great example of generalists. These are things that um, will eat anything. They'll visit a variety of flowers that they're, they're not as picky in their diet or, and or they exist for as adults for the majority of the summer, meaning that they have to um, visit multiple species of flowers because hardly any flowers are blooming through the entire summer. So if you wanna be active as a flower eater over the course of the summer, you need to, you can't be super specialized. Um, but even within generalists, there's a lot of diversity. You've got things like this unequal cellophane bee, which is one of the first bees to emerge in the spring. And as soon as the sun comes out and it gets into the high 50s in the next couple of weeks, this bee will be out all over yards, all over the state. Um, and has a strong preference for flowering trees, red maple, willows, uh, anything that's blooming early, particularly these, these shrubby things. And then it's, they're gone by the end of May. Uh, they're gone meaning the adults of, of the year have died and have started the next generation underground. Um, so that's one sort of quasi-specialized generalist, limited diet, limited um, phenology. But then there's other bees like these two uh, sweat bees on the right that are active from mid-April to into September, and they're visiting a wide variety of flowers. Um, some of them have habitat preferences. Some of them, um, we don't know, they're less so. Specialists, these are the picky eaters. These are the things that can only survive on the pollen of small number of plant species. Um, I think, what did I say? There's 20% of the bees in Vermont are specialists, so um, dozens at least. Some of them uh, visit the, only visit willows, for example. There's a half dozen species of mining bees that are specialists on willows. These are some of the first to emerge in the spring, and then they're done about the time the willow blossoms have died up in, um, in, in mid-May, maybe, sometimes even earlier. And yet to be shown conclusively, but it's likely that there are specialists that sp prefer one or two species of willow. Even if we can't tell the willow species apart, it seems like some of these bees have preferences for different willows. Um, future area of research. There's a bee on wild geranium, this pink flower that you might have in your garden, but also grows wild in hardwood forests and mostly in southwestern Vermont. This bee is only found on that flower. Obviously, then it has a pretty limited range in Vermont because this flower is not super widespread. Um, compare that to a, this goldenrod specialist that could be found anywhere in the state where there's goldenrod. Um, same with this uh, squash bee, the hairy squash bee, which is a um, cucurbit specialist. So this is a really cool story that um, dates back to what Julie was talking about with the Abenaki cultivating squash. Um, throughout or in Vermont and then other native tribes cultivating squash throughout North America. Uh, the genus of plant originated, I think, in the Southwest US, maybe Central America. And this bee uh, evolved there, but was able to follow Native American cultivation of squash over centuries uh, uh, across the country. I think, I think it's 
on both coasts up into Canada, basically anywhere that squash is grown, you'll find this bee. Um, and like if you, if you put a zucchini plant in one plant in your garden and there's never been zucchini there before, if there's a squash anywhere within miles of your house, it's likely this bee will show up. They're pretty remarkable in their ability to find squash blossoms. Um, and they're only in squash blossoms. Um, so you, you won't find them, rarely find them anywhere else. Um, this is another one of my favorites. This is the ground cherry fairy bee. It's less than probably five millimeters long, maybe six millimeters. Um, and it's a ground, it's a ground cherry specialist, the genus Vaisalis. So ground cherries, tomatillos, um, including the wild ground cherry, which is likely what it evolved on. But there's also been ground cherries cultivated here by indigenous peoples going back quite a while. Um, but what makes this be even less common is that it also needs really fine sand to nest. It's a ground nesting species that can only dig in, in loose, fine sand. Um, so there's only a few sites in Vermont where there's sufficient populations of the host plant and nesting sites. Uh, this picture was taken in the Burlington Intervale in the community garden there. It's, turns out to be a really sandy site with a lot of ground cherries. Um, and then the ground cherry specialists show up. So it's, it's not, it's, there's interactions with people, there's interactions with land history, land use. Um, it makes it, so it's a fascinating group to study and we're just sort of in our infancy of figuring out um, all the intricacies of what's going on. I see some questions, so I'm gonna just take a second and see if I can catch up. Um, we'll talk about bee hotels and what people can go in their gardens. Um, not all plants are insect pollinated. Um, a lot of things, white pines, um, a lot of things that we eat, so wheat, corn, all of the grasses are sufficiently pollinated by wind. Um, so they would probably do fine without insects. Uh, there's people, you see headlines about 90% of the food's gonna disappear if the bees go extinct. Maybe 90% of the food diversity, but certainly not 90% of the calories in a Western diet. Um, I think you could, you could do all right eating only wind pollinated um, plants or things that reproduce asexually somehow. Um, and no, the, the uneven self envy, I, I have no idea how it got its name. The uneven part, at least, um, it seemed pretty symmetrical to me. They have four wings. The cellophane part refers to this watery sac that they, or plant, sorry, cellophane sac that they wrap their larva and um, pollen their nest in basically. So they make this like basically a plastic bag, they sh shove it full of um, pollen and then they lay an egg in there. And that it's a waterproof sac that allows the larva to develop underground um, without being exposed to water and then um, molds and fungus. So that's where the cellophane bee co name comes from. I don't know anything about the inequalis or the uneven part. If anyone can figure that out for me, I'd love to know. Um, cavity nesting bees, I guess in a sense, almost all bees nest in cavities. Um, in this sense, I'm talking about things that nest in ex uh, above ground cavities. So 12% of the bees in Vermont, roughly, the rest are nesting in, in the ground or in hives or uh, hives in the case of honeybees. Um, there's a few other more niche nest strategies. There's one that even nests in um, old snail shells. We haven't found it yet in Vermont, but it is in Northeastern North America. Um, they nest in abandoned snail shells and that is their cavity that they use to, to lay their offspring. Um, but these are examples of Vermont bees nesting in above ground structures. Um, there's, this is one of our most common species. It nests in rotting logs in maybe in old beetle tunnels. Um, cavities where the woods rotted out. Um, other ones like this, these small carpenter bees are also super common. And these guys you can find inside of the stems of um, plants that have a pithy center. So if you took a golden rod and cut it in half, you'd see like a little white dot in the middle that um, is pith. And these carpenter bees are able to excavate that and make a home in there. Um, golden rod, mints, 
even bigger things like thistle and burdock that have this pithy stem, uh, strawberry or raspberries. So uh, if you weave any standing raspberry canes, especially if they've been broken or cut about a couple feet off the ground, almost certainly have small carpenter bees nesting in there. Um, it's a pretty ubiquitous genus. Um, this resin bee, this was a piece of firewood that I drilled some tiny holes in and left it on my porch. And sure enough, in a few weeks, um, these resin bees had made a home. They pack their pollen in there and then they cover the front of the, um, the hole with tiny rocks and plant resins as a seal to keep predators out. Um, this is an example of a predator, although this is a, this cuckoo leaf cutter bee specializes in a, a species of leaf cutter bee that only visits sunflowers. Um, the leaf cutter bee builds a nest in a above ground cavity like this. And then this cuckoo bee finds that nest and lays its egg in there. So in a sense, it is also an above ground cavity nester. Um, ground nesting species. This is the majority of species in Vermont. Um, they dig, a, dig themselves a hole in the ground um, and some are really picky and really need loose high quality sand. Others like this um, striped sweat bee seem to be happy in most any um, sand substrate as long as the ground is kind of bare. And if you have a thick thatch of, excuse me, thick thatch of uh, lawn grass, harder for bees like this to access the soil to dig a hole. This um, trout lily miner here, I watched it for like a half an hour, use its, um, its mandibles to slowly scoop out dirt from this hole. And it was just like doing circles. And you can see the pile of dirt that it's accumulated around the nest. Um, and it makes this tunnel maybe like a couple feet down into the soil where it will make its nest. Um, this is another extreme. This is the bumblebee digger bee. This is on a bank of the Winooski River in Williston, right under the Route 2A bridge. Um, there's a clay bank that was exposed during the construction and it's dry and protected. And this colony of bumblebee, uh, bumblebee diggers, Anthophora, um, have moved in. They're not actually bumblebees. They're just, they're very good bumblebee mimics. So they're pretending to be bumblebees, um, but are unrelated and have a very different nest structure. And these colonies of, there might've been 50 or hundred of these in this colony building these like elaborate clay chimneys. Um, and then in the base of that, there's a tunnel and that's where they make their nest. Um, and this colony I suspect will be there for decades to come until that bridge is replaced and the colony is destroyed or something like that. Um, a lot of these species tend to return to the same sites year after year. This is uh, another fairy bee. These guys are sand obligates. So only find them where you find good quality sand. It's cool. For some of these, you can look at a map of the distribution and it basically tracks all of the major rivers in Vermont. Um, and that's a result of sand deposits that are left by these rivers in the last uh, 12,000 years, I guess, post glaciation. As the rivers move, they leave various clumps of nice sand along their former banks. And these bees have been able to find that. And um, it shows up real, um, remarkably well on some of these distribution maps. All right, so introduced bees, these are, these are things that have come across either intentionally or accidentally um, from other continents. The, um, on the right, this mining bee is, I think has been here since like the 1800s. And the thought is it came across in ship ballast in the soil because it's a ground nesting species. Common in Europe, um, one of the most common bees in the summer in Vermont. It's a quasi specialist in that it prefers um, a lot of the introduced legumes, clovers, this is on lupin, um, but I, this bee is pretty common on like red clover in June, July. So, it, and that's probably what it was specializing in on in its um, native range. The bee on the left, this sculptured resin bee, kind of a scary looking thing, introduced from Asia in the last um, couple decades. I think it's been in Vermont since like 2011 is the first record. Big scary thing, not very common. Um, they sporadically pop up across the state these days. Um, and then these another small cavity nesting species is mass bee. 
Uh, most of the introduced species we have end up being cavity nesters because that's a really easy way for them to be transported. Uh, they'll maybe nest in a pallet or in like a bundle of sticks that somehow ends up on a, a crate um, ship or plane and gets transported that way. Some of these, these mass bees, in fact, are the only native bees to Hawaii. And the thought is that they floated there on in flotsam um, as nesting in hollow stems that floated across the Pacific and then arrived in Hawaii and diversified. And there's like 50 species, uh, all native to Hawaii. Anyways, um, clubtail parasites. This is, I could talk for a long time about various um, clubtail parasitism and I'll try and keep it brief, but there's three cool stories here that sort of um, exemplify the range of, of bee diversity in Vermont. Um, the top three are the hosts and then parasites are below. This one, the bank cellophane bee, Cletus banksii, is a specialist on winterberry holly. The red berries you see in sort of uh, woody swamps, I think it's in Missisquoi, um, but this bee also needs sand. So it was a relatively rare bee. There's up and down the East Coast is basically the only place you find it. And in Vermont, it's only known from a few sites in Chittenden County. One of these sites, um, there's a huge colony of hundreds of these um, cellophane bees. And both of these two um, cuckoo bee, cellophane bees have been documented there in, in good numbers. Um, dozens of them attending this colony where they're trying to find unattended nests where they can lay an egg and then leave that egg and let their offspring develop. Um, both of these cellophane cuckoo bees are globally quite rare. Like this bottom one here, the Canadian cellophane cuckoo, I think is only known from like two sites in the last 50 years um, and maybe only a couple dozen sites ever. It it's thought to be a parasite of a different Caledes, Caledes kincaidii, which incidentally is also the host of this least cellophane cuckoo, at least one of the hosts. Um, and prior to this work, I don't believe anyone had ever found these two species using um, this Caledes as its host. So a lot of these Epiolus, these cellophane cuckoos are host specific. So they have one species that they go after um, and they're closely matched in phenology and distribution and size. Um, but in this case, the it seems like there's, what may have happened is the Caledes, Caledes kincaidii used to be in Vermont. We have at least one historical record, um, but as it was disappearing for unknown reasons, these two Epiolus found this population of Caledes banksii and host switched. So now they're, they seem to be thriving on an um, alternative host, uh, which is kind of cool and definitely needs to be further investigated. Um, the middle two, these are tiny little bees that are remarkably common uh, in, in lawns and anywhere you've got disturbed soil and um, low small weeds. They really like the tiny little plants that grow close to the ground and the edges of construction sites and in lawns where there's a little bit of bare soil. Um, seems to be a pretty close one-to-one -one parasite relationship where this is the only, at least in Vermont, this is the only host of this tiny red and white bee, which is often easier to find than these, uh, the host species because this Calliopsis is so um, small and obscure and fast and they're, they're like, eight millimeters if I had to guess. Um, and then on the right here, my right over here, um, Northern Aster Miner. This is a, a specialist on goldenrods and asters. Uh, these fall blooming Asteraceae, pretty common species, needs some level of sand for building its nests. Uh, luckily for me, it decided it's been nesting in the driveway of where I'm renting. So I got to watch this colony all fall. Um, and I also noted these two parasites. This nomad, Banks, uh, Nomada banksii, is a well-known parasite of um, this andrina, pretty uncommon species, but um, has previously been associated with uh, andrina. And not surprising because most of the nomad cuckoo, uh, yeah, most of the nomad bees are parasites of other andrinas. 
often it's there's a one nomad will parasitize one or two species of andrina. Um, but then I also saw these uh, spicotes, these blood bees, tending the same nest, so looking for uh, abandoned nests where they could lay their eggs. And it was pretty clear that they were going after nests of um, andrina asteris. And then uh, backing up and talking to other people, and it, it became pretty evident that the the range, the size, and the phenology of these two species overlapped almost exactly. So they're only they're only found together, mostly in northeastern U.S. and only found in like August and September, um, and at sandy sites. So I'm pretty confident that this is the a, an obligate parasite of Andrina asteris, which was previously undocumented. Um, and there's hundreds or at least dozens of parasitic species in Vermont where we have no idea what their host is. So this kind of thing is um, not uncommon uh, with careful observation and even in a suburban backyard, it'd be, it's not impossible to find new host associations. Um, so this is some more mind blowing parasites that I'll only talk about quickly because they're not bees and because there's so many of them I could talk about for days. Um, these are non-bees that live off of bees. Um, because bees are vegetarian, they're, they're the base of the food chain. They eat the plants and then everything else eats them. Um, and there's a million different ways to eat a bee. So for example, this is probably the craziest thing you'll hear all night. But this inside this red circle is a full adult twisted wing insect. So this is an order of insect. So like order being on the level of beetle or um, lepidopter. So butterflies and moths are in order. Grasshoppers and crickets are in order. And this is another order, probably the most obscure order that most people have never heard of. Um, and we don't really have a good understanding of where they fit taxonomically. But that is the female and the rest of her body is inside of this male mining bee abdomen and she'll never leave. Um, she'll pump out eggs, or uh, I think she gives birth to live larvae, these tiny little, um, I think they can fly, or they can, they're can at least mobile. They'll come out, land on the flower, and then crawl into an unsuspecting bee. And in most cases, these species appear to be host specific. So they only uh, live in one or two species of bee host. And then, so there's dozens of species of these. Um, they get inside of the host, and the females develop like this, the males develop and then emerge and go find a female to mate with. So I've never seen it, but theoretically, you, if you're lucky enough, you can find a male that's attached to a female inside of, another, inside of its host bee mating. The male's probably a little bit bigger than that um, pale brown spot. Um, not super common, maybe one or 2% of specimens I find have one of these. Sometimes they'll have two females inside of them, and the bees seem to be surviving just fine. Although I'm sure it doesn't help their overall survival long term. Um, there's also other twisted wing insects that parasitize crickets and wasps, and quite a few a uh, variety of uh, insect hosts that all have different um, twisted wing insects that parasitize them. So that's one way to eat a bee from the inside out while it's still alive. Um, Another example here, this is the two moon bee wolf. This is a wasp that um, grabs and paralyzes adult bees. So in, um, in this picture, it's, ho it's grabbing a, a spicotes, a blood bee, which in itself is a kleptoparasite of other bees. Um, so it's a vegetarian, but it's stolen the pollen from another bee. And then this wasp comes in and grabs that bee flies off with it, buries it underground, and lays an egg that will then develop eating the, this um, blood bee. Uh, and then this same wasp might come back to another flower and grab a different species of bee and put it in a different hole with, it, with another egg. And then the, other, the third way that um, I touch on is these bee flies. This is a, a true fly, order diptera. Um, I've seen them hovering over bee colonies. They go up to the hole of a, a host and then the female sort of kicks some eggs into the hole and hopes that one of those eggs can, can find a, a bee nest and develop eating off of the bee provisions. 
Um, so those are the parasites. Make you glad you're not a bee. Um, I'm gonna take a look at the chat. Recommendations for books. Looks like someone's got me covered. Kleptoparasitic, parasitic, and that they steal nests from other bees. They kill the young of other bees. Um, in most cases, they steal the nest, but in the process of doing that, they kill the the larva of the of the other bee. Um, sometimes they'll the larva hatch first and eat the egg. Sometimes the larva eats the other larva. Sometimes I think they just eat the pollen and starve the other larva. Um, kind of like cowbirds and how they often end up killing the host species. Um, cut the stems of pithy plants. If you, if you don't cut the stems, can the bees access the, the pithy parts? Not necessarily, especially the small carpenter bees. Um, they, they tend to only be able to get into plants that have damage or that have broken off. So often they'll break off in a windstorm naturally and the bees can get in there that way. Um, but it does seem to help. If you cut them, you often find more occupied stems, although I'm sure they, I mean, they, they go way back before pruning shears. Um, difference between bees and wasps by sight. Uh, it's tricky. There's, there's some that I still stumble over. Um, bees tend to be hairier and, uh, but the only way that I know to do it is just to look at a lot of pictures and look at a lot of specimens and eventually you get to know the, the possible bees and then you can eliminate the wasps that don't look like those, I guess. Um, ground nesting bees live basically anywhere that they can get to bare ground. Um, sometimes they'll go through like a, a sparse lawn, but often they, they much prefer an eroding river bank or the edge of a driveway, um, sand pits, anywhere where there's soil that they can access without having to get through too much vegetation. Uh, climate change. I will try and touch on that at the end when I talk about threats and conservation. Um, it's, a, it's an open question that I don't have a lot of answers to, unfortunately. Um, bumblebees, these are the ones that you might be familiar with. They're, in, they're pretty ubiquitous, they're pretty large and charismatic, and we know slightly more about them than we do about other bees because they're relatively easy to identify, and we've been studying them for a little bit longer. Um, there's Roughly 17 species known from Vermont. This is a really cool illustration that our AmeriCorps member did showing uh, the various, various species of bumblebees likely to be found in New England. All of these um, exist or used to exist in Vermont. There's a few exceptions that I'll talk about in a second. Um, but basically from this diagram and from, from looking at the color patterns of the abdomens, of, you can identify um, the majority of bumblebees you're likely to see pretty quickly, or not quickly, but relatively straightforward. Um, so for, for the bird people in the audience, I like to compare bumblebee identification to something like catharis thrushes or um, colliderous sandpipers, the peeps. These are things that um, are tricky to identify for the novice, certainly, and have some pitfalls. Um, with practice and with good views, it's often possible to learn them and to, to at least separate out the obvious ones. And then there's some, some other species that are a little bit harder you need a closer look and um, some more time with. Uh, these are three examples though you can, I mean, red, yellow, black, it's, it, and then red, yellow, black. There's really only one option. This one doesn't have a yellow band there. Um, this is the most common species. It just has a single band of yellow. It's the only one with a single band of yellow. Um, this is a, another um, relatively distinctive species, black, yellow, yellow, black. Um, we have lots of great uh, information on identification of bumblebees on our website. I have a link at the end and I'll try and post it in the chat if I get a chance. Um, also, while we're talking about parasites, check out this mite. It's hitching a ride on the um, armpit of this yellow banded bumblebee. Um, if I had to guess, I suspect it's a flower mite that's harmless to bees and is just trying to trying to move around the landscape because it doesn't have its own wings. So it's hitching a ride. There are some parasitic mites that um, 
or less helpful, but we don't know. Yeah, hard to tell from that picture. Um, bumblebees, basic natural history, because um, it's a little different than a lot of our other native bees. So in the next couple of weeks, as soon as it gets nice out, uh, early April, mid-April, the queens will emerge from the ground. These are the really big, obvious bumblebees that you can hear from a mile away. They often buzzing low through your garden, looking for nest sites. Basically, they come out. They've already been, um, they've already made it, so they're already fertile, and they find a nest site, um, a rodent burrow, uh, protected um, indentation in the ground, a, a variety of different sites, even. And Masisco, even they're known to nest in um, wood duck boxes because there's, the ground is so wet. They, they've sort of, they seem to have moved up into the uh, above ground a little bit. That's uh, less common. Um, so yeah, they, they make this nest. This queen will lay a handful of eggs, um, pack a, a ball of pollen, and then that larva will develop into a worker. So these are the workers. These are the majority of the bumblebees you see, especially midsummer. So in this graph, the blue, July and August. Um, and these are females that whole, sole purpose is to gather pollen to feed to, um, to, to build more nests, to make more workers. And then eventually, at the end of the season, the queen will start laying um, new queens and male um offspring so right before the colony collapses or the colony uh dies off for the year and it starts to get cold the queen will put out new queens which are these big females and males they'll mate um and then the, the males will die and the queens will overwinter and do it all again next year um so queen worker male how do i know it's a male um, because I'm holding it and it didn't sting me. Um, obviously there, <laughs> I knew it was a male before I grabbed it. Um, that's something that I can't recommend, but is definitely doable with, with practice. Um, I've, I still occasionally grab, make a mistake and grab a female and, um, pay the consequences, but 99% of the time I'm right. Um, it's a great party trick. You can hold them by their legs. And then they, they release totally, totally fine and happy. Um, it's a great way that you can show kids that you can pet them. They're really uh, soft and fuzzy. Males have an extra antenna segment and an extra abdominal segment. Um, not something you can count in the field, but you can, with enough practice, you can see the difference in length and um, get a sense of it that way. They also will never, they don't collect pollen. They're pretty useless in that way. They don't have the pollen collecting apparatus on their legs. Um, they're just there to reproduce with next year's queens. Uh, and I'm seeing some more chat questions. Let me check the time. All right, so I'm gonna have to hurry up. Um, I'm gonna come back to all the questions at the end in just cause for sake of time, it's almost been an hour. And uh, uh, for my Bumblebee Atlas, this is something that uh, VCE started in 2012. We surveyed all of these orange dots collected a bunch of data on bumblebees um, and then went to museums and looked at all of the historical specimens that had been collected by students and professors and compared the two basically. Um, a little more complicated than that, but you can see this graph that shows the difference between the 19th or 20th century records and the 21st century records. Um, pretty drastic changes, um, especially for select species. So this used to be the most, the third most common bumblebee in Vermont, has not been seen in Vermont since 1999. It's now, in part because of this work, it's now federally endangered. There's a few remnant populations in the Midwest, um, but it pretty drastic collapse in the, in the 90s, we think. Um, similar declines in Bombus terricola, which has since come back a little bit. Bombus pennsylvanicus disappeared, I think in 2000. Bombus ashtonii is a, Kleptoparasite of Bombus affinis. So, as goes the host, there goes the parasite. Not, it was very rare to begin with. Um, this is the relative abundance of like 
the percent of bumblebees collected in that time period that are that species. So almost a third of them are a common Eastern bumblebee, Bombus impatiens. And I bet if I made this figure today, it would be even further out. The species is, is doing really well. Um, it's a super common adaptable generalist. It's in all the major cities in the East. It's used for pollination and it's sort of, it's starting to spread uh, worldwide, which may or may not be great to be determined. Um, yeah, so pretty drastic changes in the bumblebee community, which sort of was our impetus to, to look beyond bumblebees and to look at all these other native species that we had basically no data on. Um, so now I'm gonna shift gears to talk about Missiscoy. Just touch on some of the cool things that we found in the first year of surveying. I think we're up to 91 species for the refuge. It's almost a, almost a third of the species that are in Vermont are in this small refuge that pretty remarkable given that it lacks um, some of the habitats that other species need. So there's, no, there's not much sand and there's very little upwind hard, uh, like rich Northern hardwood forest, maples and ring of emeralds. And those two communities um, combined have a, a large portion of the bee fauna of the state. Um, we found some really rare species. We were regionally rare species. This is one of the only records of the pigmented miner for all of New England. I think we found four species, four individuals this day, and one of them the, the spider had found first. Um, it's a fairly common species in the Midwest, but just barely makes it into New England, apparently. Um, this is at, at Louis Landing, for those of you familiar with the refuge, right along Route 78. Um, great broadleaf wetlands, um, good bumblebee communities in, in a lot of the habitats. Um, there's, a wet, there's a pickerel weed specialist that we found abundantly. Um, lots of generalists, including this one here. And, and many of the generalists that we found, many of the species that we found were above ground nesting species. Um, because it's so, the water table is so high, they they found ways to nest in in ca existing cavities and rotten logs and um, other above ground situations. This is one of the rarer species that I suspect um, would be a great conservation focus of the refuge, and we're going to do more surveys for this coming summer. These are the loosestrife bees. There's three species in this genus Macropus, all of which need um, pollen and also oils um, from this genus of native loosestrife, Lithomachia. These are yellow flowers. These are not the purple loosestrife that we're all trying to eliminate an introduced species. Um, this plant is kind of forgotten about, kind of overlooked, and um, often it's in ditch, roadside ditches and wet farm fields and places that are um, we're not doing a great job of preserving. The, these three Macropus bees have apparently declined in the Northeast and in, in uh, North America. Um, hard to be certain because you're never going to find this bee if you're not looking on this on this flower. So it's hard to know if we're not seeing them because we're not looking or because the flower and the bee have, just have declined. Um, but there's a healthy population on the refuge. So I'm optimistic that I can find the rarest, one of the rarest bees in the world. Someone deemed it that, but it's a cleptoparasite of the, this genus. Uh, Epioides is the parasite of Macropus. Um, it was thought to be extinct for a while, but has subsequently been found in, in several New England states. Um, and I think there's enough of a population here that we stand a good chance of finding it on the refuge. So that, that'll be a focus for this coming summer. Um, all right, so as I'm in the field, I, the, the question I get more often than not um, is how are, the, how are the bees doing these days? And I, I don't have the time to give this talk to, to most people I run into. They'd be bored out of their mind. Um, but unfortunately, I don't, have a, I don't have a good answer quite yet. We're, we're working on it. Um, we have a paper in the works sort of documenting what we found, basically this talk, plus, plus more of what we've found and what species are here and how we think they're doing. Um, but it, there's a lot of nuance to the data and there's a lot of things that we just don't have the information to know. 
for example, this is a graph of the number of native species recorded in each year going back to 1948 um, in Vermont. So this, this was just made the other day from all the data we've collected. Uh, obviously, there were more than 50 species in the 70s, and there was more than one species in 1848. But we don't we don't know what they were. We don't know how many there were. We have no we have no data other than these scattered records. Like these are this is the UVM collection part of it, um, and you can see like this one was collected in Barrie. This one was collected in um, 1949 in Burlington. So we have we have a a very very rough smattering of uh, um, information about what, what was here in the last century. Certainly no information before the late 1800s. Um, there's still bees here. There's more than 300 species a year, um, but that's not a very satisfying answer when someone wants to know how the bees are doing, what they can do to help. So uh, not surprisingly, there's lots of things that uh, humans are doing that uh, probably not beneficial to, to bees. Um, I'm talking wild bees here, not, not honeybees. It's a whole other uh, set of threats and conservation issues. Conservation are probably better at, uh, called agricultural issues. Um, but I mean, and <laughs> this picture cracks me up. It's a, it's a male and a female Andrina. Um, fortunately for the male, his genes are probably not going anywhere. The spider is going to have a nice meal. Um, and I'm going to touch on these quickly, and, uh, and then I can get to some questions, hopefully. Um, I think it's always, when talking about conservation, especially in the Northeast, uh, it's worth just thinking a second about what the historical landscape was and it, um, what we consider the past and what we're trying to conserve. Um, Vermont. This graph here, this is New England. This is the forested area over all of New England, um, starting 1700, largely forested. We, we cut all the trees for, for, for sheep and agriculture and a whole number of things, and then they've slowly come back, and not so slowly. Um, and then in the last couple decades, we've started to see a reverse of that trend where forests are being lost to other human uses, um, primarily development, according to this paper. Um, so this is, this is something to consider when we talk about bee conservation. Bees, the majority of bees can be thought of as sort of solar powered. They're cold blooded, so they need warmth and ideally sunlight um, to move around. And they need flowers. Most of the flowers also like sunlight. So dense hardwood forests that might have been here 300 years ago is going to have a limited diversity of bees. There's a very distinct and specious um, group of bees that are found in hardwood forests before leaf out. So when the spring ephemerals are blooming, there's a bee to go with each spring ephemeral. Uh, but after, after the canopy closes in late May, hardwood forests have very low bee diversity and abundance. Um, and then there were, conversely, there were in the late 1800s when Vermont was 80% or I think um, deforested, there were lots more grasslands and thus probably lots more, lots more grassland bees, probably species that are no longer here just because the trees have come back. And we'll probably never know because we don't have specimens from then, but um, you can only imagine what was, how things have changed in this period. And somewhere in here, you got to add the introduction of honeybees, which had, a, I'm sure, had huge consequences that um, we'll never fully understand. So, habitat degradation, I think, is is um, a little more concrete. Something that we can all rally behind is a um, invasive species like Pragmites taking over these remote um, semi-boreal bogs. This was in the Southern Greens, pretty high elevation remote site. Um, so it chokes out a lot of native plants, and including plants that are important for bee species. Um, concrete doesn't is not a great place for most bees. There are a few like these introduced species that um, will nest on on concrete, and they build like a pebble nest and sort of glue it to the side of a cinder block or a 
a building even. Um, and they also really like weedy plants. So this combination of introduced weeds and concrete is good for a couple species, not great for most of the native species that evolved here. Um, pesticides, uh, matacloprin is an example of a neonicotinoid, one of many. There are also plenty of other classes of pesticides we should be concerned about, uh, but a matacloprin in particular has gotten a lot of attention and uh, I believe banned in most of Europe, now regulated in Vermont, but still widely used on a variety of crops. Um, neonicotinoids in general are like potentially problematic because they're systemic insecticides. So you would apply them to the seed and then the whole plant is poisonous to insects, which is great if you're trying to prevent grasshoppers from eating your corn or um, other pests from eating your plants. But bees are also plant eaters, um, albeit they eat the pollen, but they're still consuming 100% uh, plant. And if the plant that they visit is um, laced with insecticides, probably not a great thing. Plenty of lab studies have shown decreased fitness and survival and number of problems associated with exposure to field realistic levels of imatocloprin. Um, this is a rare bumblebee visiting a pea in my garden. Luckily, it was not a neonicotinoid treated seed and the bee was probably fine, but um, not all bees are gonna be so lucky. Introduced species, uh, like I said, there's maybe 15 introduced bees in Vermont. Um, plenty of other introduced wasps and plants and mammals even that are causing harm to the bee communities probably. Um, this is one study looking at the genus Osmia. These are mason bees. Uh, two species, cornifrons and taurus, have been introduced into the US for pollination. Uh, I think of, they came from Japan for cherry pollination in the Midwest and maybe Mid-Atlantic. They spread all over the Northeast in the last 20 years. I think this graph is like 2003 to 2017. Um, basically showing that as these introduced species have spread, all of the related native osmia have declined. Um, all of these are now in Vermont. And it'll be interesting to see if we see similar patterns. I think this is from the Mid-Atlantic. Um, but no reason to suspect that Vermont osmia are going to be aren't gonna be similarly affected by the recent arrival of these larger introduced osmia. Um, another introduced species, this is a, another one that's probably in a lot of gardens, might be harmless. It really only, it really prefers introduced plants, Russian sage, some of these other minty garden plants, but um, there's potentially unintended consequences that we're unaware of. This figure here is like, four hours old, um, you're the first to see it. This is gonna be in our, something like this will be in our upcoming paper, but it's showing the proportion of introduced, proportion of observations of bees from Vermont that are of introduced species. So in 1946 or whatever, there 100% of the bee records we have are from introduced species. Uh, in this case, it's probably only one or two individuals, um, but in some other years, all of the species are native. Um, and all, sorry, all of the records of individuals are native. So like 20,000 records in the recent years. Oh. Um, and there's a general increase, this decline in the last decade, I'm curious about, it may be an artifact of sampling intensity. Because um, also shown in this figure on these red lines are the date of first record of it each introduced species in Vermont. So I think it was Andrina Wilkella was first documented in the 30s and each new addition through time. Um, quite a few species have recently been documented in Vermont. Uh, it could be because we're looking harder, could be because they've recently arrived. I suspect it's a little bit of both. Um, so number of introduced species is definitely going up and some evidence that the number of introduced individuals or the proportion of introduced individuals is also going up, which is what you'd expect as uh, the landscape becomes um, modified and more 
more European with plants and um, gardens and um, less, yeah, as, as, as the landscape changes and becomes more human dominated, I guess what I'm trying to say. Um, pathogen spillover, this is potentially the biggest factor in um, bee declines, if you call it that. Um, the, the loss of some of the bee species and uh, bumblebee species, I think, can be tied to pathogens spilling over from commercial bumblebee hives, which you can buy to pollinate your tomatoes or blueberries. Um, this figure shows a virus, the deformed wing virus. Um, this was done by some UVM researchers. They went out and they collected a bunch of bumblebees and honeybees from like 300 sites across Vermont. And they compared the levels of the prevalence of this virus in both honeybees and bumblebees. Um, the higher the prevalence of the virus in honeybees, the higher the prevalence in bumblebees, suggesting there's some spillover and they're going back and forth. Um, at sites with no honeybees, there were, was no um, deformed wing virus found in bumblebees, suggesting that the honeybees are in fact the culprit. Um, there's a lot of implications of this that are yet to be worked out, but concerning nonetheless, this picture is a honeybee hive that I found in the woods on the side of a road in Northfield last fall. My guess is it was a backyard honeybee that hive that escaped. They swarmed for various reasons, um, started a colony in this tree. Winter came, they all died. And then you've got this nest that could have any number of mites and viruses and um, harmful pathogens that are susceptible to spreading into wild bee communities. So what can we do to help? Um, we're just, we've got a lot to learn still. Um, we, we don't know the natural history on, on the majority of these species, what they need to survive, what they need to nest, where they live, um, what the major concerns are. But we do know enough that we can, we can start to do things and it's, it's um, certainly not too early to start acting to address threats that we, we know. Um, so identifying important habitats uh, is certainly important and preserving places like Masisco so that there are examples of relatively undisturbed habitats where um, natural processes can continue. Um, this is a cool example. This Parnassia miner is an obligate specialist of fengrass of Parnassus, small white flower found in poor fens in Vermont. So it needs calcareous wetlands. Um, and if the flower disappears, the bee disappears in much of its range in the Northeast, there's some pretty serious declines in the plant, mostly from um, development of wetlands and increased nitrification. So runoff from lawns and fertilizers and nutrients getting into the wetlands, changing in, changes in hydrology that are allowing Phragmites and other introduced plants to outcompete the fengrass, which spells doom for the bee. So we need to find more examples of this plant and protect the wetlands from these threats so that the bee and the plant can continue. Um, and we need to, for a lot of these other species, we don't, we don't know what the threats are. And there's um, a lot to learn before we can get to this point. Um, there's things you guys can do to help using apps like iNaturalist, take pictures of bees, other insects, other plants. The online community um, will help you identify them. And then that data is available for research for us almost immediately, potentially. And, just, and talking to people and to engaging with um, planning commissions and town government and other people that have um, landowners and Getting people engaged and interested and uh, educated on the topic is certainly a good first step. Um, federal and or state oversight of commercial bee movements would be great. Uh, honeybees are still shipped all over the country for pollination services. They could spend the, the summer in Addison County and then hop on a tractor trailer truck, go to uh, California to pollinate the almonds and then up to Washington to pollinate blueberries. 
and then make their way back across Alberta. Meanwhile, they could be picking up all kinds of pathogens that then they deposit in back in Addison County. Um, and then there's movement of commercial bees for pollination, uh, bumblebees, um, some osmia you can buy on Amazon, I think. And there's very little regulation on that, that so, and it's a major source of potential introduced species and pathogen spread. And then we know that quite a few uh, pesticides are quite harmful, um, and yet they're not, we're slowly making progress on regulation, but that's an area we could do more. How can you as a private landowner help and as a consumer? Um, these are maybe not the, the top things you'd hear elsewhere about saving the bees, but I'm a strong advocate for maple syrup over honey. Um, maple trees are native to this landscape. Maple forests are maintained in the production of honey. Um, or sorry, a production of maple syrup, not of honey. This uh, is a project of uh, Vermont Audubon, these stickers, bird friendly, um, also probably bee friendly. They, these are sugar bushes that are managed for biological diversity and not just um, sugar production, maple syrup production. Um, on a related note, our forests, especially near urban areas, are being increasingly damaged by overbrowsing from uh, white-tailed deer in particular. Especially the uh, number of hunters in Vermont is declining. The number of deer is rapidly increasing without um, other predation. There's no mountain lions, there's no wolves. Um, so to save the, the wild bees in your landscape, I would uh, suggest thinking about hunting or encouraging your neighbors or allowing people to hunt on your property if you have the acreage, um, reducing deer populations to more natural levels um, will help regeneration of forests, increase diversity of understory floral communities, um, implications for birds and bees and all kinds of other forest inhabitants. Um, and then the other thing that uh, is easy enough to do is to stop mowing as much. Lawn is probably one of, second to pavement in the, the least productive bee habitats we have in the state. Um, and by not mowing or by mowing annually instead of weekly, you can increase the floral abundance of an area in, in, a, short se in a single season. Um, which will provide a lot more resources for bees. Um, and native plants are, are likely to colonize the less you mow, the more native you're likely to get. So a lawn is primarily introduced grasses. Um, you let it go for a few years mowing maybe once every three years and in four or five years, you have a nice goldenrod aster field that has a lot of goldenrod and aster specialists and they're parasites and they're parasites, parasites and the list goes on. Um, I am not an expert in pollination gardens, but um, this is a list that I sort of put together of things that grow wild that I would suggest encouraging. And then this PDF that um, I think I have a link to in a second is a great resource for pollinator gardens, specifically tied to specialist bees. So um, nice aesthetic plants that grow well in gardens and attract specialist bees. Um, as do most of the plants on this list. Asters and goldenrods, dogwoods, these are things that grow in overgrown or abandoned fields. Um, just need to reframe how we think about these habitats a little bit. Um, sumac, I really like, it's got a, has a, a specialist bee. It provides a pollen source in early, late June that when there's not a lot of other native plants blooming, um, and then the nests are great nesting habitat for a lot of these above ground cavity nesters. Um, wild bergamot, winterberry holly, both have uncommon specialists. Zucchini hosts the squash pea, and who doesn't like zucchini bread? Um, willows are probably the easiest thing to grow. You stick one in the ground, and chances are, stick a twig in the ground, and chances are in five years, you'll have a full bush that has a handful of specialist bees on it. And you don't have to touch it, especially if it's wet. Um, quick, fast growing, sort of a border plant. And many thanks to everyone. This is obviously not just my project. I've had a ton of help um, from VCE and from 
the broader Vermont community. We've got funding from Fish and Wildlife Service to do the work at Missiscoy. Uh, Vermont Fish and Wildlife has helped with some of the other work. Many supporters and um, enthusiasts that have um, donated a lot to us and to and time and resources and expertise. And Okay, I have 23 um, questions in the chat. I can try and touch on them and um, I will leave, oh yes, there's the question slide. Um, I will leave this slide up if you guys wanna either screenshot it or make notes of some of these links on additional resources. Friends of Missiscoy, um, VCE has a monthly newsletter with some, this summer I'm gonna have a field guide to the bee of the month in there, just highlighting one or two species of bees that are active that month to look for. Um, we have this VT, uh, val VT eco studies slash VTBs, and there's a whole key to bee identification with species accounts. It's a work in progress, but um, eventually we will have a page for each of the 350 species with a map and some natural history and some photos. Um, and then this key to, to work your way through it without at a not um, non-expert, non-taxonomic level. The bumblebee key is pretty solid and is worth checking out. This is so bombus dash key. Um, and the, there's a table you can explore by genera on there. And then if you still don't have a calendar for the year, um, Daisy has uh, made these calendars. She works with us in pollinator calendars with a pollinator each month and a small portion of the proceeds go to support this work. So check them out. Um, and then I'll, I can start uh, the top of the questions if I can find it. Where are we? Climate change, um, I wish I had more to say on the topic. I think there's there's lots of threat. A lot of the Northern species of, um, we don't have a lot of data on. I wish I knew more, but um, we're gonna need to do some more work and more modeling on that. But it's, it's something we're working on. Yes, definitely um, violets and strawberries and um, especially, both violets and strawberries have specialist bees. Andrina Viole and is the violet specialist. Self peel is a good for um, a lot of bumblebees. I don't, I don't think it's native, but I might be wrong on that. Uh, rhododendrons have a specialist, although more likely it's the wild azalea is not the, I don't think it's ever been found on the um, garden variety, although bumblebees love it. I don't, do bumblebees store pollen nectar over the winter? I believe they store it all as fat. Um, I think they, they stock up in the fall and then their metabolism slows um, basically to nothing. They basically more or less freeze, although they're right below the frost line, frost line I believe. Um, related to climate change though, that's interesting. And believe it or not, warmer winters are actually harder for queen survival because their body temperature is higher for longer and they burn through more resources because they're cold blooded. Um, so a cold winter with a stable ground temperature is ideal for bumblebee uh, queen survival. Franklin County Bum Beekeepers Club. Looks like there's an email in there. Um, male bumblebee eyes are generally larger than females, not... Um, in, in some species, it's really obvious. In some species, it, they're quite different. Um, do, how do I feel about rent bees, mason bees and bumblebees? Um, that's a good question. And I think there are good economic arguments to be made for blueberries and for certain other um, crop pollinations. I think I, I would wanna know that the situation deserves it. Um, there's some cool work coming out of the Gund Institute at UVM a few years ago, showing that wild bees are adding a tremendous value to blueberry pollination um, above and beyond what honeybees can do. And I would, wouldn't want to jeopardize existing wild bees by bringing in mason bees or bumblebees. Um, but I think in larger operations without healthy wild bee populations, it's definitely an option. And I think it's, it's potentially a, a good option that um, can be negative consequences can be minimized. 
Um, and the closer to the source that you get your bees, the better. So if you can find um, bumblebees that were reared in New England, that's ideal. The less they travel, the less likely they are to bring diseases with them. And I think you can even buy like disease-free colonies these days. Um, so worth doing your homework on that, but it's not a hard no. Um, volunteers for bee counting at the refuge and in general, I um, will encourage you to go towards iNaturalist and to, to photographs. Um, we may have some sort of volunteer events where we get out and do um, bio blitzes for bees and for other taxa. Um, we're sort of stepping back from the, the data collection this year and doing more analysis of all this data that we have now. Um, so keep an eye out for on our, um, on our blog or on our newsletter, there may be opportunities, um, but we love volunteer submissions through iNaturalist. Um, photos of bees from anywhere in the state are, are great. We have some resources on that VTB's guide here um, on how to use iNaturalist and how to maximize the um, enjoyment with bees and learn a little bit along the way. Backyard water source for bees. Um, not something I've thought about, but potentially a good thing to have, especially in dry areas. I think, I mean, in the West, I've seen bees congregate at like a leaky um, fountain, but I think most places in Vermont, I, I wouldn't, I'm not terribly concerned about there being enough drinking water, but during a drought, I, I think a bird bath would go a long ways. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. Similar or higher or lower diversity of bees in prairies versus forests. Ooh. Um, I, I'm gonna guess, and I might be wrong on this, that prairies have substantially higher diversity uh, of bees, um, in part because they have flowers for the whole season. Uh, there are quite a few bees in the, in the mid, uh, Midwest, I think some, high, some of the higher diversity. Um, but believe it or not, the highest diversity in North America is in the desert in the Southwest. Um, quite a few, much higher species richness there than there is elsewhere in the country. Um, but how does this correlate to land change in Vermont? Um, that's a good question. I think. I, I wish I had more data on um, what was here and what exists in intact hardwood forests. Um, there are definitely species that are only in the forests. Um, yeah, that's it. I wish I had more information on that. Neonic treated plants kill bees and other pollinators. Why are they still being allowed to be sold? Um, a good question and uh, I, I wish I had an answer but I think it it comes down to economics and to um, it makes it easier for farmers to make a profitable crop of corn or of soy or whatever the, the crop may be. Um, I think the first place that I would look to, to regulate that would be for the home consumer use. Um, you can buy a lot of a lot of trees and nurseries even Around here, the nursery trees will come treated already. Um, so that's something to be aware of when you're buying nursery plants. Um, and you can buy a jar of neonicotinoids at Home Depot and you can dump the whole thing on your garden if you wanted to. Um, whereas most farmer use is more judicious and probably better regulated, a, a little bit regulated, if not uh, enough. These are pretty cool. Um, organization working to regulate pesticides. I'm sure there is. I don't have something off the top of my head. Um, yeah, I think um, deer permits in Hanover. I think that's something we hopefully will see more of. There's some towns in Vermont that have really high uh, deer densities and it's um, really hard for a lot of the native wildflowers and shrubs to to reach uh, maturity. You walk in the woods and you can see which plants the deer really like and which ones they don't. Um, and that I think 
especially in areas like Hanover where it's uh, suburban and um, small rural lots that it's hard for hunters. There's not a lot of hunters and deer populations are going up because they're loving everyone's garden. Um, yeah, great saving native seeds is a great way to go. Um, bee wasp nests, I suspect, um, most people see bee and wasp nests, they're going to be the, the paper wasp nests that um, are made by a, a couple different species or genera of wasps. I think the, if you if it's really can't deal with it, I think the best thing to do is to, at night, um, on a cold night, ideally, put, a, put it in a bucket and, and knock it down and take it away. Um, if it's cold, they won't be active. But um, the sprays, I worry about them getting into the food chain. Uh, so the raccoon comes and scavenges the nest. They're going to get whatever that wasp spray was. Uh, more questions. Do, 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 do. Yeah, um, bird bats and drowning bees is that's something to to think about. Is if you're doing um, in your own backyard, um, I've seen bees fall into watering cans and get stuck in five gallon buckets. And I actually have a few specimens in our collection from various five gallon buckets of water that I've seen, and some of them have been um, rarer species. So um, don't intentionally leave open containers of water lying around, especially colorful containers will attract bees because they think they're, um, they think it's a flower. So you could, you could, you could put a stick in there so they can have a way to climb out, um, would, would help. And then, oh, I, I didn't mention snake worms, but yeah, that's right up there with deer in terms of effects on our forests. And, um, I think that's, I'm, that's something I'm kind of scared about. Um, both in a, from a gardening perspective in Vermont, but also from, yeah, forest uh, health and understory communities. And I don't know what the solution is. There's never going to be a hunting season on them. They're, everything I've heard sounds like they're, they're here to stay and they're going to get everywhere they can. Um, best thing we can do at this point is to limit their spread. So uh, there's some good webinars coming out of UVM on snake worms. Um, and one thing I guess that's encouraging is that the adults, I think only the larvae or the eggs masses survive the winter. Um, and the adults need a certain number of growing days to reach maturity to lay eggs. So I saw a map that showed the state and parts of the, the colder parts of the state theoretically don't have a long enough growing season for snake worms to become established. Um, that offers any hope. How to prevent bees from getting into buckets of water? Um, keeping the buckets dry and or a stick so that they, anything that fly, flies in there can climb out. Uh, and it's not just bees, just, I've seen crickets and um, butterflies will sometimes get stuck in water and the surface tension usually keeps them on top and they can um, climb out that way. All right, I think that's 8.30. So I'm gonna um, pass it back over to Julie. Thank you so very much, Spencer. That was just a plethora of information on bees. And I am definitely going to go to the VCE website and do a little bit more digging. Um, my naturalist season is coming up and I have lots of new flowers growing at my house this year. So I'm excited to see what I can find out there. So thank you for sharing everything that um, you did tonight. So that was great. We appreciate everybody coming. There was great interest and that was really good to see. That's, that's good for the bees, I think. So, so good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>